a wonderful evening to be with you again and to be with each other as men. Amen? And I tell you, uh, when men begin to take their place as God appointed to us in this world, the world is not going to be the same again. In the history of mankind from creation up to this time in history, the greatest movements in the world, whether they were movements of righteousness or movements of evil, were usually led by men. Often time starts with a visionary, a man with a vision, and is able to inspire other men to follow that vision, and very soon history is going to change. That is why the devil is very much afraid of us, because he knows that in the patterns of history, every great move in history always begins with a man. And I want to tell you, one man can make a world of a difference. Can we say that to the person beside you? It takes one man to make a world of a difference. We have so many examples of that, not only in the history of the Bible, you know, from Enoch to Noah, Abraham, the great Moses, David is a great leader. He was not perfect, but he was able to accomplish a movement in Israel that later on would inspire Israel towards faithfulness to God and righteousness. And we have seen Paul who has shaken the Roman Empire. And there's where there are comment in the book of Acts that this man who have turned the world upside down, <laughs> right? It just takes one man with a vision and a passion from God, a heart that's willing to obey regardless of the price, a man who will take his stand for what God has put in his heart, no matter what happens, that one man can change the world. Can you say to the person beside you, you are that man. It's a matter of choice. You can choose to be less than what God meant you to be. You can choose to be the person that you were meant to be. In every man, God has placed tremendous potential for us to achieve his agenda in the world, his purposes in the world. As I said during the conference, we are like eagles the, who are thinking that we are just chicken. And so long as we think chicken, we will not be able to unfold the full potentials that God has placed in our lives to achieve the unique destiny and purpose that God has put into you. When you were there in your mother's womb, God programmed the DNA code, and that's in Psalm 139, and gave you whatever you need, potentially, to achieve your own unique place in this world. There are many people who believe that man's birth in the world is simply by random chance. I don't believe in that. I don't know if you believe in that. Every human being born in this world is born with a purpose. St. Catherine of Siena, St. Catherine of Siena said, if you become what you were meant to be, you will set the world on fire. If you become what God destined you to be, you will set the world on fire. Men who have been used by God to advance civilization forward in history were men who believed in one thing, that they had a purpose. And they were committed to fulfill that purpose in their lives, and they will die fulfilling that purpose. These are the people who changed the world. Can you say to the person beside you, do you believe you have a purpose in this world? Or are you just a product of evolution and random chance? <laughs> you understand that? Today we're going to talk about the making of a man based on what God ordained and designed us to be in the very beginning of time in creation. And so tonight we're going to focus on what God designed us to be. What was God's purpose for manhood? Why did God create the male species and distinguish the male from the female species? There must be a reason for the distinction of genders, right? And if you imagine, just right now, let me ask you, if you imagine a world where there were no women and only all are men, what do you think the world will become? A world of only men, but no women. 
Can you imagine what the world will be like? You know, I received an answer from an attorney in one of my seminars before on manhood, years ago in Manila. And he said, Sir, I have an answer to your question. He's a middle-aged man, well-known uh, lawyer. And he said, if there were no women on earth and only men, I believe humanity would have gone extinct thousands of years ago. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Man's ego is often balanced by the emotional sensitivity and relational sensitivity of the woman. It's always the woman who stops the man from violence. Understand that. You will see that more in the next dinner. So to anticipate the next dinner, our topic next dinner, be sure you come and you invite other men. We're going to talk about how to love a woman the right way. Are you interested in that? How to love a woman the right way. It will apply to married people. It will apply to singles. So single men will not have a great tribulation trying to win a heart, the heart of a woman because they know now how. How many of you have been single for the last 30 years and you're still single? <laughs> okay, great. You're in the right place, brother. <laughs> because you're going to learn what makes a woman tick. And you'll discover that when we study God's design for the woman. Once you understand the Creator's design for man and woman, it's easy to understand the woman. Many, how many, how many married men are here and your biggest struggle in life is trying to understand your wife? Come on. Okay, there are a few honest men here. <laughs> okay, I remember a time I was in Cebu, I spoke in a big Chinese church and after I talked about marriage, and then when I came down, the eldest elder of the church, around 70 plus, came to me, a big, tall Chinese, you know, it's like a, it's like a, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger type, you know, big guy. And he came to me, Pastor, I am so blessed by your message, but I have only one question. And I said, yes. You know, all my life, I have studied and learned so many things. But there's only one thing I can never understand. And I said, what is it, sir? My wife. <laughs> How many of you are going through the same problem? <laughs> Next month, you will understand your wife. I want you to understand the design of God for a woman, okay? So tonight, what does it mean, what does it take to be a man? Okay? We are men of Integrity International. This is a place where men, can we read this together? Where men help men become better men. Nobody's perfect here. I'm not perfect. I've been learning all throughout the course of life. I've made many mistakes, committed many blunders, but I rise up. And that's what it means to be a man. You never stay on the ground. You keep rising up and learning from your mistakes and allow your mistakes and your failures to mentor you towards success. Let me tell you this. Two of the greatest mentors of men are the very two things that we are most scared about. Failure and enemies. Any man here who not, doesn't have any enemy Everybody has an enemy, right? Yeah. Hope it's not your wife. That will be the worst. <laughs> okay. Failures and enemies. Because failure allows you to get a closer look at yourself. It's like a mirror where you see where the defects are. You understand that? And if you allow failure to serve as a mirror, that mirror, that failure, will be one of the stepping stones towards greater success in your life. Okay? Do not be scared by failure. You learn more from failure than from lectures. Once you understand the purpose of failure. Secondly, you learn more from your enemies. There are two kinds of enemies. The real enemies 
and the fake enemies. Fake enemies are enemies that you think they are against you, but actually you're the one judging them and thinking that they're against you. The real enemy is committed to destroy you. Fake enemies are imagined enemies that you think are trying to destroy you, but you're actually destroying yourself by making false judgments about the person. Okay? Listen to this. The benefit that an enemy can give to you is that enemies tend to exaggerate the flaws in your life. Because the enemy, unless he is dis intentionally trying to deceive people, and there's no kernel of truth to his accusations, most enemies take a flaw in your life, as little mistake, a little error, and they exaggerate it. And that's why they create a lot of hostility. Okay? But what do you learn from them? Try to find the kernel of truth in what people accuse you of. And if you're honest enough, if you're man enough, to be honest, you can learn something from your enemies. Because enemies are committed to expose what's wrong with you. And we need them. Did you hear what I said? We need them. Because sometimes we can be so blind to our own flaws and our own mistakes and our own failures. An enemy is committed to bloat that out and show it to the world. Do you understand that? So, anyway. This is a place where men help men become men. So we learn from each other. We learn from each other's failures and mistakes, how, how we're able to get over those mistakes and be able to move forward. That's what we're here for, right? So you say to the person beside you, we need each other. Because we're going through the same struggles. It takes a man to understand a man. Okay? Can we say that together? It takes a man to understand a man. And you're that man, brother. <laughs> I need you. Okay? We also have seen being male is a matter of birth, just like our slogan in the Man of Integrity. Becoming a man is a matter of choice. Nobody becomes a man simply by biological growth. There are a lot of men who are around age 40, 50. I've talked with them. I've, I've interacted with them. But sometimes they think like teenagers. Their character, their attitudes have not yet really matured enough. Because manhood is a choice. It's the choice to build those qualities that make you the man that you were meant to be. It's such, always a choice, okay? As in Michael 6 eight defines for us what God requires of men. He has showed you, a man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That you act justly, that's integrity. And love mercy, you show compassion to others. In other words, we don't allow greed to cause us to worship things and sacrifice people because we show compassion to people. We value people more than material things. That's compassion. And, and thirdly, that we walk humbly with our God. It takes humility to recognize that there is authority above you, right? The reason um, there are people who refuse to believe in God is because they don't want to be accountable. Most atheists that I have read about, I've been reading for the last many years, you know, you'll discover that a lot of what are called atheists are not people who are not, who are not necessarily intellectually convinced that there is no God, but rather these were men who had so many disappointments with God that they started to believe there's no God. Because it doesn't fit anymore their reason. Okay? Most of the time because of bitterness, in their hearts, not because of intellectual persuasion. Okay? I don't know, did you see the movie uh, God is Real? Uh, God is Not Dead? You see? At first, the professor seemed to be believing that there's no God out of intellectual persuasion, but it turned out later on it was bitterness against God. Because he could not understand God's way, so there must be no God. Okay? It takes humility to recognize that there is God above you, okay? Mentoring men, our purpose is for effective godly leadership and influence in the home, the church, the workplace, community, and the nation. Our goal is to build men characterized by those three values, spirituality, integrity, and compassion. So tonight, we're talking about the making of a man. Let's take a look at the story of creation for a while in Genesis chapter two, okay? I'll read this for you. 
This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And it's followed by the narration of the creation of the woman, the first woman. Okay? First of all, let's take a look at where it all started. If you'll notice in the story of creation, after God formed the man from the dust of the ground, the first thing he did was to take him and put him somewhere. Where is the somewhere? In the garden. Let me give you a background to understand the historical context of this story, okay? In, in ancient times, kings had private gardens. How many of you have heard about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? One of the wonders of the ancient world. The Hanging garden of, Gardens of Babylon was the private garden of King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most very well-known emperors of the Babylonian Empire that had relationship with Israel because he conquered Israel and deported the survivors into the provinces of Babylonia. It was during the time of the prophet Daniel, okay? And kings have private gardens and pri their private garden is a place of intimate fellowship with the king's wife and usually wives because they have a harem. And it's also a place of intimate conversation with the king's closest friends. Nobody can enter into the king's garden without the king's invitation because any attempt to enter the king's garden without the king's permission will cause you to lose your head. That's why in the story of the Garden of Eden when man sinned, he drove man and woman out of the garden and God stationed cherubim with a sword of fire. Nobody can enter the garden of God. This is his private garden. Now, I want you to ask you a question. When God formed man from the dust of the ground, why did God take the man out there in the field and then put him in his private garden? For what reason? And this defines the first calling of the man. The first calling of the man is to worship God, the one who made you, to fellowship with the Creator. Before God created the woman, God desired fellowship first with a man. I want you to understand what this is. Benjamin Disraeli, a very well-known uh, Jewish philosopher, very respected by the people of Israel, he said, man is made to adore and to obey, but if you will not command him, he will, if you give him nothing to worship, he will fashion his own divinities and find a chieftain in his own passions. This is a very basic truth about men. Men are always trying to find something bigger than themselves to which they want to commit themselves as the object of their significance and their security. And that becomes their object of worship. Is there any man here was no desire to commit himself to something bigger than himself. Something that gives him a strong sense of identity, a strong sense of significance, something that provides him a strong sense of security. It can be your job. It can be your position. It can be a woman. It could be fame, fortune, or anything. Anything that gives you a strong sense of significance and security, and it becomes the object of your passion and your energies, that is the object of your worship. 
every human, every man cannot find meaning in life if he's not committing himself to something bigger than himself. Every man is searching for something that will give meaning and significance to his life, something that he can achieve, something that will be the product of his performance. It could be fame, popularity, anything that will give him a strong sense of meaning and significance. Whatever that object is, it becomes the object of worship. Do you agree with that? Okay. Now listen to this. The story of creation reminds us where our true significance lies as men. You know, psychologists say that the two deepest drives in human nature is the drive for significance and the drive for security. Anything you're doing right now in your life, whatever you are pursuing right now in your life is either fulfilling a drive for significance or a drive for security. Do you agree? God designed us that way. That's why God knows us. Can you identify what drive you are right now following in the pursuits that you are now engaged in? In your work, in your business, what are you, why are you doing what you are doing? For what purpose? Ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? It's either I'm trying to find significance for myself here, or I want to have security so that I know all my needs will be met and my family's needs will be met, that everything I need will always be there for me. You see, men predominantly are driven by significance. Women predominantly are driven by security. I want you to reflect on those words. Men are primarily driven by a need for significance. That's why men are most sensitive to criticism about their performance. Men are most sensitive to failure because it comes against their nature to perform and to succeed. While women primarily are driven by the need for security. That's why for a man, the most difficult experience we can go through is the experience of failure. Most men begin to break apart or even commit suicide because of a major failure in life. Women, on the other hand, because they're probably more concerned with security, are most deeply affected by the betrayal of the man they love. For a woman, that is the most painful experience of life, to be betrayed by the man he loves. Okay? Because that just removes all the security of her life. Okay?